And this morning we're continuing our series on the signs of Jesus. And I'm just going to, I'm going to ask your permission slash a little bit of a warning. Is that all right? It's going to be a little weird today. Is anybody else all right with weird? Does weird freak anybody out? If you've not been here that much, you're like, okay, uh, the bubble's about to pop. We're about to find out how crazy Brooks actually is. That might be the case. But I love the weird parts of Scripture because so many times in the weird places of Scripture, what we find going on is that we're, we're able to pay attention because what we hear seems so audacious, it just stops us for a little bit. So we're going to get a little weird today. Before we do that, I want you to think about um, things that are impossible. Think about how, how do you react to the impossible? Now, I know in our world now, uh, if, if, you, if you're on Instagram or social media or, or Pinterest or anything, that what you might be seeing is these, these, um, these inspiration posts, you know what I'm talking about, that, that try to convince you there is no such thing as impossible. We can, we can spin impossible really, really well. For anybody who is a kind of an achieving type A person, uh, we love it when someone tells us something is impossible because we immediately try to get it done. I'm, I'm looking at people looking at their spouse or their friends right now. <laughs> like, if you want to get me to do something, tell me it's impossible. Like, Chad, it's impossible to eat 12 thin and crispy fillets at Catfish Charlie's. All right, let's do it right now. <laughs> but that sort of a thing. Uh, I, I think about impossible, and I look at some of the, the solutions we have found to fixing our portable system when we break something on Sunday morning. It's like, yes, that was, yeah, we fixed that. That was possible. But there's also kind of a dirty side to impossible, kind of a scary side to impossible, right? There's a piece of us that we don't want to know about the impossible. We don't want to think about the impossible. Miriam Webster defines impossible as something that's incapable of being or occurring, something that's just, it cannot exist. But the interesting thing about impossible or impossibilities is the concept did not enter the human language until the 14th century. In the grand scheme of things, that's not too long ago, really. If we look in Scripture, and when I saw that, I was like, okay, well, I know the word impossible is in the Bible. I mean, I can think of a handful of verses in the New Testament off the top of my head the second I started thinking about that. So I went in and, like, went for it and realized that, yeah, the word impossible is in the Bible, but they define it really differently. In Scripture, they define impossibility as the act of being powerless or disabled. Now, that's very different from what Miriam Webster says, that it's incapable of being or occurring. And in fact, there's actually not a word for po- impossible in Scripture. They just negate the idea of possibility. They just put a, a negative uh, in front of the word for power, and the word for ability, saying there's no power or no ability. And here's the thing. If we think about impossibility here, and I look down, like, to be honest, and I get, I get deep down inside of myself. Personally, you know, any of my own fears about impossibility, they stem a little bit more from a lack of power or a lack of ability more than they would the idea of something not occurring or being. And I imagine many of us kind of can resonate with that as well. So today we're going to read a story of impossibilities a story of multiple things that we might think are impossible. And we're going to look at it in a way that, that I don't think many of us think about. So if you would, just open your Bible with me. We're going to be reading out of John chapter 6 today. This is the fifth of Jesus' signs. And it's a story that we're familiar with. It's a story that we've actually, I preached on a few months ago from a different, uh, from a different gospel. And so this, is, this one's familiar to us, but there's something that John puts in that nobody else really talks about. And that's what we're going to look at today. So John chapter 6, uh, you can read on the screen behind me. Uh, you can use your Bible, or if you brought a phone, you can use your phone. But John chapter 6, verse 16 through 21. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got in the boat and headed across the lake towards Capernaum. And soon a gale swept down upon them, and the sea grew very rough, and they had rowed a three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. And they were terrified. But he called out to them, do not be afraid, I am here. And they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. 
So there's a couple impossibilities that are going on, but this story is actually part of like a larger chain. Last week, Lindsay uh, preached uh, the feeding of the 5,000, a very familiar uh, story about Jesus. And this is, this is immediately afterwards. It So it's like Jesus like fed all the folks. There's like a giant Holy Spirit buffet, and then he wants to get out of town. And the reason he like wants to get out of there is he was trying to get out of there when these, all these people found him. That after Jesus does big things, we see him, there's a pattern all across the Gospels of, of resting, of retreating, of, of Sabbathing. He wants to go away by himself. And he was attempting to do this when the 5,000 caught up with him. So after that fourth sign, he immediately goes right back to it. He, he manages to get away. So the disciples were waiting on him. They were, this was part of his pattern. They kind of knew what was going on. They're in Galilee. Capernaum is like home base for them. And so they're like, well, you know what? He's a big boy. He can get there himself. We're going to meet back up with him in Capernaum. We've been with him for a year, year and a half by now. We know what's going on. Anything like we look at the disciples abandoned Jesus. No, they were kind of just used to him needing to go off by himself for a while. And so they decide to get in their boats. They're going to go across the Sea of Galilee back towards Capernaum. Nothing weird here for them. Uh, Peter and his brother James were fishermen. They had employees. They were used to having boats, multiple. They're going across Galilee, and a storm comes up. Galilee, especially at this time of the year, it has storms. It's this giant inland sea. And the, 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 the atmosphere creates this weird storm system coming down off of the east side of the lake. Uh, it, it, meteorologists will understand, explain this better, but like, like uh, hot air and cold air meet repeatedly. Like there's storms. It's like it's going to be there. That's the reality of the Sea of Galilee. There's going to be storms. And so they're going home in the middle of the night. They're, they're halfway through. Scripture says they're uh, three or four miles across the lake. They're there. It's getting gnarly. And then Jesus starts walking on water towards them. Now, earlier, we, we, when I spoke about this last time, uh, the writer had, had wanted to talk about Peter's experience of Jesus calling Peter to come out on the water. And there's two things going on here. Either Jesus normally walked on water or these writers are all talking about specific experiences of that same eventful night. I'd call that eventful, wouldn't you? So they're there, and uh, they become scared. And I think that their fear probably was based off, not off the storm, because these guys were used to it. I don't like to be around boats. I don't fish. I stay away from boats. But for those of you that, that fish and are out there a lot, you know good and well storms going to happen sometimes. You can get through it, and I'll let you do that, and I won't be in the boat with you. But Jesus comes in walking on water, tells him to not be afraid. And just this picture of him walking on water is just multi-layered in, in Scripture, that Jesus is, is showing dominance over the sea, which is an image in the ancient Near East of chaos, of the primordial um, mess that humanity was in. He's showing authority over that. He's showing authority over the storm. He's showing authority over the fact that he can, he can do whatever he wants. There's just multiple ways of looking and saying, I am in charge of everything. But what John tells is a couple of things that he says and some details. And the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. I am here. Now, I am here. I probably text that to somebody three times today already. But when Jesus says it in such a specific way, it's this loaded statement in Scripture that brings us back almost to the very beginning says I am here when Moses is uh, thousands of years before this sees this burning bush and he becomes scared and the burning bush begins speaking to him he says I am he says who are you I am see God is the only self-reference being in this world we try to self-reference ourselves all the time and we typically get ourselves in trouble when we do that but God is simply saying I am is here. Look what I do. Look what my characteristics are like. Look at how I interact with people. Look at how I love people. Look at every single thing you do, and that's who I am. So you have Jesus walking across the water, and he immediately uses this term that only God has used to, to talk about himself. He says, I am here. The absolute degree of certainty, of control, of safety, of power in the world. I am here. He's telling the disciples it's going to be a little bit different. 
We think back to our conversations this last month about the signs of Jesus and how John spoke about them differently than the miracles and the other gospels, that, that Jesus' signs, these signs are about the glory of God and the reality of God breaking into the world and being here, and that when God is here, different things happen. And what we're seeing today is that when the presence of God is here, that it changes things, that Jesus' present is going to mess with the disciples' proximity. That when he's there around them, some different things are going to happen. The presence of God, and also it works fundamentally differently than we can expect. Okay, I just spent a week on vacation a couple weeks ago. I was in the water every single day, multiple times a day, like jumping off a dock into a lake. There was like a, a big boathouse, it was like 15 feet in the air. I did that, it was awesome. Like I tubed the Comal River, like true redneck style. I mean, tube to river, that's, that's the way to roll. I mean, the whole nine yards, I was in the water every day, multiple times a day, but you know what I never did when I was in the water? I never walked on the water. Now, I didn't sink because I'm naturally buoyant, but I can't walk on that stuff. Can you walk on that stuff? It's this sign here, Jesus saying, when my presence is here, things are going to be dramatically different. It's a classic story. But this sign isn't over. There's another part of this, and this is where it gets weird, because Honestly, I was reading this a few weeks ago, kind of prepping for today. Just my, my normal first thing I do when I start working on a message is I read the passage like 15 times, and I write down any single thing I think about. And like maybe 10% of those questions or observations might get answered. I just start writing stuff down. I write stuff down. I'm writing it down, and I get to this, this one part about it. And I'm like, what in the world? Let me read 621 to you again. Then they were eager to let him in the boat. And immediately they arrived at their destination. Immediately. Let me read this again. Then they were eager to let him in the boat. And immediately they arrived at their destination. See, this sign isn't over by chance. The Sea of Galilee, just the way it works, the way you get to Capernaum, like there's no earthly way that this could be. Like I, 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 I did more research on this passage than I typically do, and, and the only, most commentators don't even want to handle it. And the one that did was like, well, they, they were probably like 100 yards offshore anyway. I was like, well, okay, the guy walked completely. Like, Jesus can walk on water as far as he wants to. I mean, he already did a 5K out to the boat the first time around. Like had on the, the T-shirt that he got for signing up. The disciples had orange slices in the boat for him when he got back on. No, probably not. But this immediately thing. And the more I thought about it, the like I can handle walking on water a lot easier than I can handle immediately. Like I, I'm used to that story. I heard that when I was a kid. Because you can like straight VBS the, the first part of this story. The first part of this is action and sign of Jesus. But the immediately business, like what, what's going on? We realize that Jesus' presence, it messes with proximity. We've talked about these signs, these visible manifestations of the glory of God, that Jesus' divinity uh, inbreaks into our humanity, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, has the ability to come into our world and to change things. He can change anything. He can, he can do anything. And, and, you know, for so long, like, Jesus is kind of railing against the crowd, the crowd, the crowd, because they want party tricks. That's the word I've used all through the series to describe it. But in reality, that's what it is. They want party tricks. Like, hey, do this. It's cool. Can you do this for us again? Can you, it's bugging him constantly. And honestly, let's think about it. When we ask Jesus for a miracle, for a sign, we're asking for party tricks. We want solutions to problems. That's what I do. But Jesus is coming here and saying that I am much more than solutions to problems. And that the presence of God and the potential and the ability that the presence of God has when it's in our world is rewriting our story, is rewriting every single angle and element of the fall, that it has the ability to change everything. And that's what all these signs have been about, the ability of the presence of God to change everything, to turn water into wine, to heal people, to come up with a buffet at the snap of the fingertips. And now in this sign, we see that God's presence has the ability to change mass, to change gravity, to change the law of physics and time. 
this is a little weird, right? This is kind of beyond where we normally want to think about it. But here's the thing. Each of us need Jesus to reframe time for us. If we're going to be honest, we need him to change time for us. We need, Jane, we need Jesus to go into our past. And we're comfortable with that statement. What we also have is we need Jesus in our future. Because think about this. What is the most valuable commodity that any of us have? It's time. I don't know about you, but the thing that I defend that I want more, I don't want more money. I want more time. I want to add like six hours to my day. I want another day in the week. I need more time. I want to make better use of my time. Just this, Jesus wants to come in and to reframe our time. And I'm not going to share with you, we're not going to get all back to the future today. Don't worry. Okay, but here's the thing. Our time can be reframed. Our time in the past uh, can be redeemed, and it needs to be redeemed. Our time in the present here in this life now and what we're doing, some of us need that to be healed. We don't need to have the effects of the past to be uh, just ruling and driving our present anymore. We need time to be healed for us here in the present. And then we need to, our time to be healed in the future so we can understand what purpose is, what mission is, what the things that God are calling us to do. Because we assume that if we're walking alongside our life with Jesus, it's going to be the best absolute life that he has planned and desired for us. We need Jesus to come and to reframe our time. And if he can do this, he can certainly come into our life and to change time and all manners and means for us. We need Jesus' presence to come and mess with our proximity here and now. Now, there's a lot of smart people that, uh, that, that, that they're thinking about physics and, and, and all sorts of other isics that I don't understand. And are looking at theology and science and, and are talking about how there's things that we're finding now uh, through research that oddly like, line up to the way that, 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 that deep level Christian thinkers have been thinking and saying. But I'm not one of the smart people. I don't, I don't understand science very well. I never claimed to. I took Math 99 five times in college. Barely got out. But what I do know is pop culture and movies. And I think about this a lot. And all this week I've been trying to find a way, like how do we really understand this narrative of God coming and changing our time? And I realized that one of my favorite actors in the world, almost every one of his roles, he's talking about time somehow. And I struggle with even doing this this morning before I realized there's just so much truth in these characters that help us understand how Jesus wants to come in and change time for us. Now, Matthew McConaughey in the iconic movie Dazed and Confused. On my top five favorite movies, the only one in my top five list that does not involve the end of the world. So no Red Dawn, none of the Mad Max movies. His iconic character, Wooderson, okay? We know Wooderson, right? We've seen Dazed and Confused. I'm not going to quote him this morning. I can't. But what we see here is a person that is fascinated with and absolutely stuck in the past. Okay, how many of y'all know what it means to be stuck in the past? I think to another movie character, I think of Uncle uh, Rico and Napoleon Dynamite. If Coach would just put me in, if Coach would just put me in, we would have won state. We laugh and roll our eyes, but you know what? Every single one of us has that version of if Coach would have put me in in our life. We're stuck in the past. And specifically, when we think about his character, Wooderson, what you see is well, this is what happens. This is the danger of being stuck in the past. That we're attempting to self-define ourselves. Remember, in, in Jesus, it's the only person who can actually self-define himself. That when we're stuck in the past, we're attempting to self-define the present by elevating the past without regard to the future. We have no care what the future might look like or could hold. All we want to do is to wish the past would have happened. And let's be honest, church folks are really bad at this. You know, we have this idea of the good old days. And some of you might be saying, oh, Chad Foundry's only like two years old. We don't have good old days. Yes, we do. We have good old days. That no matter what, if it's in organizations or if it's our life personally or if it's the way that we view the world and see how people interact in it, when we're stuck in the past, we're thinking about those good old days. 
then we begin to stop focusing outward and we begin looking inward. We stop caring about other people. We stop thinking about how other people can uh, interact with us, how we can interact with them. And instead, we only care about ourselves and this idealized present that exists in our mind. We get stuck in the past. We need Jesus to heal that. We need Jesus to to help us to realize that there's future possibilities and potentials that we cannot understand and we can only find by the way that we rest and focus on him. The second truth about uh, about time and Jesus coming in healing time is about present time. I think of Matthew McConaughey's character, Russ Cole, in True Detective. The infamous quote from that entire series is, time is a flat circle. His character in this, in this television show was extremely nihilistic. He thought that life was horrible and that we are condemned to repeat the same cycle of horrible over and over and over. And even, even when we die, we re-trigger that loop and go over and over and over. And this sounds, this sounds silly. And some of you are thinking, like, Chad, I don't, what, I don't do that. But here's the thing. How many of us have ever thought our life would not ever get any better? and thought that we were absolutely stuck where we are now. That we are living defeated lives. And here's the dangerous part. If we live in defeat long enough, we begin getting to the point to where we think even Jesus can't fix this. That we live in a world where no past exists and no future exists. And it's just our own miserable present. And we alienate ourselves from God, from even the great truths of God there. Jesus wants to come in and heal our present. And there's the thing that changes everything right here. This is the place, this is the posture that the church has taken right here for a thousand years. Uh, this last role, I went back and watched it again yesterday to make sure I understood this right. But Matthew McConaughey's character, Cooper, in Interstellar. First of all, if you've never seen Interstellar, <coughs> I watched Interstellar when I was sick in Nicaragua on Nicaraguan cold medicine. I was running 103 fever. You want to talk about watching a movie like Interstellar? (laughs) It was wild. (laughs) But in this movie, Matthew McConaughey plays a a failed NASA pilot, and the world is stricken with another um, another uh, dust bowl, and crops are dying, and humanity only has a few decades left on the Earth, and he. Uh, finds himself contacted and goes onto a mission into a wormhole. And it just, it's, it's messed with dimensionality and all sorts of things. And this weird story, it's the, that's the weirdest thing that I think can actually narrate this whole weird thing about Jesus and this whole a time immediate thing. Because this is the posture the church has taken in regards to time for thousands of years. This is the posture that God's people have taken for thousands of years. Is that because of our relationship and because of our hope and our anticipation and our faithfulness that we push into the future into this promised kingdom of God that we push into the future and we grab it and we pull it back into the present. That's what these signs have been. It's been this final reality of God in which this entire world is fixed and changed and made whole and made perfect and is limited only by the holiness of Jesus and how it pushes into the world and spaces and places just for moments. Jesus wants to heal our future. But he wants us to understand that his healing of our future is a reality that we have here in our present. And affects the way that we view these actions in our past. That we are no longer bound by the things that have hurt us because Jesus can heal those. We are no longer bound by despair in the present because Jesus can heal that. We instead now look towards the future with purpose, with possibility, with anticipation, with promise. The promise of what Jesus says, this is what I want to do for you. This is who I want to make you. This is what I want to turn you into. These are, this is what I want you to learn and understand. That Jesus' glory is fundamentally different than what we can come up with on our own. That these are the glories of the things to come. So this week, and this is what I've been thinking myself, this is what I want you to think about. I want you to ask Jesus, 
where, and I want you to tell him where you think, where do I need to see you move immediately? Where do I need to understand in my heart, in my mind, in my soul, these future promises and these future truths? This is my boat moment, and I need you to take me to the shore. And he wants to do that, and he promises the ability to do that. And one day we're going to see cool things like this. I believe that 100%. But what I love even more than that is how he promises to come in and to do these things in our heart and our mind and our soul the most. Because that's what matters. The Merriam-Webster definition of impossibility is very uh, robotic and very very linear and very normal. It's this can't exist and this cannot uh, uh, occur. But what our heart needs when we think about impossible is this idea of powerless or disability or lack of faith or lack of hope or lack of trust. Jesus comes in and heals us right there. He wants to take you to the exact place on the shore that you need to be.